Good morning. It's great to be here. I'm Daniel Goroff, and today I want to share with you some of my private opinions. These are not necessarily those of the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, but they should be. And I also owe much to the um, inspiring and I should say reproducible work of uh, some Sloan grantees, and I will list and thank them more at the end. So uh, to begin with, I hope everyone knows that uh, Alfred P. Sloan was the person who organized and put together General Motors. He started the foundation to fund breakthroughs in science, technology, and economics. And in his own running writing, he emphasized very much the importance of data and getting the right information that you need to make decisions. But can we really trust the results of data science? Uh, the Economist magazine a few years ago said no. And they said that we should expect about a third of the kind of results that you read from data science to be just wrong. And I'm not talking about fraud here. I'm talking about everyone just doing what everyone else is doing as data scientists. And nevertheless, their conclusion is that about a third of it should be wrong. And I want to try to explain that and see what we can do with it by talking about how we use data, how we Re could reuse data, and also how to avoid abusing data. And these last two will be surprisingly connected uh, by thinking about these privacy issues that we all worry about. Okay, so how do we do data science these, idea these days? The ideal is to start with a hypothesis or a model, and you have a plan that you register in advance, you collect the data very carefully so it's unbiased, you analyze it, you publish all the findings, you let your data out, and you let other academics and researchers check what you've done, and that's the ideal. Okay, how about in practice? Well, in practice, you gain access to some really interesting data set, and then you start trying things. And you try this hypothesis and that one and another method and another sample. And you pick the best one that seems to give you a result that looks good. Um, you might get some machine help in doing that. But um, you write it up as if you would follow the ideal steps and you publish the findings. And maybe, maybe you release some of the data so that other people can check what you're doing. Okay, so this is called p-hacking, and we have to think carefully about it. And I want to talk about using evidence and give you my favorite example. So suppose that you know that Tom is either a salesman or a librarian, and you find out that he has quiet personality. So how many people would say that he's a salesman? Nobody. <laughs> how many people would say he's a librarian? Okay, just about everybody. All right, so this is a question about conditional probabilities, the conditional probability of being a salesman giving a, given that you're a librarian or a uh, given that you're quiet, excuse me, or a, a conditional probability of being a li librarian given that you're quiet. Okay, so we know that there's a large conditional probability of being quiet given that you're a librarian. Okay, but that isn't what I asked you. I asked you about the probability of being a salesman, okay, given that you're, that you're quiet, or a, or a librarian. So um, let me illustrate that by now asking about Fred. Fred is either a salesman or a librarian, and you know nothing else about him. Now what would you say? What's more likely? Salesman? Lots of people. Librarian? Well, what are there more of in the United States, salesmen or librarians? There are about 100 times more salesmen than there are librarians, okay? So I want to come up with one equation to help us see this and use that equation for several different things. So first of all, the definition of conditional probability is just the fraction of, of B that is A. The probability of A given B is the fraction of B that it's A. <clears throat> so then in this picture, the probability of being red given that you're blue is maybe an eighth. The probability of being blue given that you're red is maybe a half. So those are two different numbers. And we can just rearrange that definition to uh, get the important question, the equation here, which is that the odds ratio is the base factor times the base rate. So those are those ratios. And that odds is really what we're interested in. It's the probability of, if you're testing A against B, A given the data, the ratio of that to the probability of B given the data. And that turns out to be the base factor where you flip the order of, the, of these conditioning 
times the base rate, which is the odds that you started with, the prior odds. Okay, so if you think about this in terms of the base rate fallacy, if there's 100 times as many salesmen as librarians, and say one in 10 salesmen for the sake of argument might be quiet, <clears throat> turns out it's much more likely that Tom that you're looking at here is a salesman who happens to be quiet because there are lots more salesmen than it is that he's actually a librarian. Okay, so you have to keep in mind that the odds are the base rate times the, um, times the base factor. All right, now that's fine for, I mean, managers get this mixed up sometimes. It's fine for them, but, you know, of course, data scientists wouldn't do that. I mean, in magazines you can find surveys where they went out and looked at CEOs and they found that 85% of them had a dog when they were a kid, and guess what they concluded? That you should go out and get your kid a dog, right, so that they'll become a CEO. So it's a difference between these, these uh, conditional probabilities like that. But of course, data scientists would never do this. Well, let me now talk a little bit as a Bayesian um, and say that what we actually do is um, we talk as if we're studying the probability <clears throat> of a new hypothesis given the data. Whereas classically what you actually study and report is the probability of the data given the null hypothesis. And you call that P and you reject the null hypothesis if um, that P is very small. And classically that's when you call it statistically significant. You break out the champagne and you, you uh, publish your paper and everybody's happy. Now, there's a researcher named Johnny Anidis who the article in The Economist is based on, and he said, if you follow those rules, everything turns out to be wrong. Um, and you can look at the equation that we, uh, we derived at before to find out why. Because he's, if you think about H1 as being the hypothesis that the finding is true, H0 is the finding that it's false, and D is the data analysis that says that the finding is true, then uh, the economist takes the base rate in this to be one in nine. So in other words, if you tar started with a thousand hypotheses to test, they're just kind of assuming for no particular reason that I know of that about a hundred of them would be right, or about a tenth. So um, that's what they assume. And if you do that and you go through what happens here, you, that's what they assume about the base rate. You have to also talk to them about the base factor. So the base factor, by convention, scholars know what to do with that. You want to make it as big as possible so that when you're given the data, you get a bigger ratio. So what you do is ex ante, you decide that the power on the top, that's the probability that the data says it's true given that it is true, is bigger than or equal to 0.8. Why 0.8? I don't know, it's a convention. You want the denominator to be small, that's the p-value, and that, you say, is if it turns out ex post to be less than 0.05, then again, you publish and everybody's happy. So that tells you what the um, base factor is. It has to be at least 16. So that's the, just the convention for everybody who publishes. And here's what science goes through. If you do that, then of the 1,000 that you started with, 100 of them are actually true. 80 of them will be confirmed true. You'll get 45 false positives, and you add those together, and you get 125 publishable results, which you will claim is, are true and supported by the data. But guess what? Only 80 of those actually are true. So that's about 64% of the ones that you went out and published and told people that the data supported. So that's their calculation. And so now what do we do about that? Well, um, the, the prior odds get multiplied by this base factor. You can try to mess around with the base factor by taking p equal 0.01 and alpha equal 0.9. People have suggested that, but it's actually hard to do all that. Um, but instead, if you reproduce, then uh, the prior odds get ma multiplied by 16 the first time, and then the original odds are multiplied by 256 the next time. So if you take the 125 that look true and then try those again, then you get a, a success rate. Instead of being about 64%, it actually comes out to be close to 95%. And so you can see this on the graphs here, um, that that's, that's the difference between looking at uh, one test versus two tests. And the economist claims that the base rate here should be about 0.1. 
Um, everyone who writes to me with their proposals, their priors are that they have about a 90% chance of being correct, but that's okay. Um, it's somewhere in between, and we can improve what those base rates are by reproducing and doing things over and over again. So that's the case for, for reproduction. And um, so I wanted to say something about phishing and dredging and p-hacking. And uh, let me just say that uh, if you test lots of hypotheses and report the p-value for your favorite hypothesis, then you're kind of uh, not being completely honest. And that's what lots and lots of people do, and it's a problem. But if you think about privacy, um, some of the privacy techniques that have been developed recently, some of them with help from the Sloan Foundation, um, actually allow you to, so you know about these privacy issues, they allow you, by using this idea of differential privacy, to explore data and to explore multiple hypotheses without running into this problem of p-hacking and hypothesis phishing and so on. So um, you can characterize this in terms of that uh, equation for the odds and the base, base rate and the factors. I'm not going to talk about that right now, um, but I will just summarize by saying that many of the data science discoveries actually are false, that reproduction solves many such problems as we just saw, um, that there are new tools that make reproducible e re excuse me, reproducibility easier even when you have private data um, so I'm talking about this idea of differential privacy. And the idea there is not to pay too much attention to any one observation, not to overfit your data. Um, and that's what you want to keep things private, and that's also what you want to avoid this kind of uh, p-hacking and hypothesis phishing. And so the bonus is that, that the privacy tools that are being developed can help make better, better data science and also help people have access to private data sets to do good research. And here are a few of the things that uh, the Sloan Foundation has been funding. And uh, you can look these up on the web. Um, but they're interesting, great projects. Thank you very much.